from an education perspective, what does broadband change uh, for people? And, you know, obviously when you think about online learning and education, what are the differences for the people that have, uh, have broadband versus don't? And I think just kind of laying the context for this discussion. So uh, as we get into it, everybody's clear. So think about like, hey, like right now we're on a video call. Can people that don't have broadband, you're not doing a video call. So let's maybe just, uh, what, what are the things you guys think of when you think about uh, the, the inequities of, between broadband and no broadband in education? I think a lot of it, Nick, is the fact that uh, you, know, you can either study from the comfort of your own home or you can study from a park bench um, where we had, so we have uh, some wireless hotspots that we set up in some of the community parks around Longmont so that students could go there in the warmer months and do their studying online, you know, out at a picnic table. So I think that's really one of the advantages for those that have it and those that don't. Libby, what are you saying? Yeah, I mean, I think from a school from a school standpoint, it's pretty visible the inequities that you know lie in terms of um, access to strong internet um, in in our schools, and I think that's always been true. And I think that there's been like tremendous work done in in our city and in our state since then. Um, but working um, it, it with a population that's largely students of color, I think you know it's it's clear that there is a lack of access or less access for, for students and families of color. And that has certainly provided a limitation as we've tr transitioned very quickly. So I know as we made the transition this past spring, you know, our very first, for, first part of our, our work was really around ensuring 100% of our students had access to working technology and to um, internet. And I think it, I was impressed with how quickly we were able to close that gap. Libby, what were some of the things that you guys were able to do, you know, because I mean, what's interesting is a lot of your schools are in the metro, you know, Brian and I have a lot of conversations about getting access in, in, in rural, rural parts of, of, of Colorado and Wyoming and other states. Um, I'm, I'm curious to, you know, what, what were some of the things that you guys were able to do uh, inside the metro, because it's not just having just the access, it's being able to afford it, right? Yeah, being able to afford it, being in a stable like living situation where um, you know you can set up internet and have it on a daily basis or throughout the day. Um, but what we really, you know, the first step was really understanding the needs of everybody in our community, and that in itself took a lot of work to reach out to all families and ensure that we really understood what they were working with. Um, and from there, you know, we supported families in um, applying for support that would help get them internet access. Um, a lot of families are non-English speaking, so even just supporting them through the challenges of um, working with service providers who don't speak their home language. Um, and then, you know, providing, you know, we also came to a point where we were just playing up providing hotspots and things like that for families that needed it so that kids could access their coursework as soon as possible. And um, we ended up being able to accomplish that pretty quick, which obviously helped put everybody at an even playing field as we started um, remote learning. I want to go back to a comment Brian made uh, kind of in the introduction around, I guess for the folks in the, in the, the, the listening, you know, to this later, let's talk about what, what are the elements to actually doing education remotely? And I think, you know, I mean, I don't have children, so I don't have that issue, but like, I think trying to be clear on what do you actually need to have to be able to do remote learning and education today? Like laptops, iPads, broadband, like, I don't actually know. So what, what, what are the things that students have to have in order to be successful today in a remote education environment? I would say yes, yes, and yes. They, they need all of the above. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a, a fiber optic connection all the way to our home. Um, but then sometimes there's a, a laptop issue. As we all know, things pop up, you know, that all of a sudden uh, an 11 year old can't figure out by himself. And next thing you know, he's looking for backup and he's looking for the iPad and then jump on that call. So it's really been interesting to watch my children be resourceful as they start to get the typical issues that anyone runs into, even when they have broadband, right? Then it's devices and switching from one platform, you know, to another. So, um, and, and then I think about, you know, the children that, that might not have all of those tools or, or, you know, finally just getting maybe that that single point of access and, you know, being that single point of failure too, right? And and we're, 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 we're very lucky that they have options. You know, our kids have options. Yeah, and even if they have uh, broadband, 
uh, what varies from family to family is kind of the digital uh, literacy, you know, how well a family, either the student or the, you know, the parent can, uh, can solve problems. And um, uh, my, my uh, I didn't mention this before, this is my uh, uh, daughter is a, a eighth grade science teacher at a suburb of uh, Minneapolis. And so uh, I've heard a lot of uh, stories uh, uh, from there and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting and uh, it's a lot of work. Um, kind of the one, the one uh, nice thing is th this semester is uh, going much more smoothly than, uh, uh, than the first or, or last uh, the spring semester uh, earlier this year, but um, that still is an issue.